So without much ado, I want to welcome our speaker for the day, uh, Margaret Jowett. Um, Margaret Jowett became fascinated with uterine function while researching mother's different experiences of birth at home and in hospital. As a psychologist, she started with the idea that stress hormones might compete with labor hormones. This led to a deep dive into uterine physiology, culminating in an understanding that the uterus itself must physically transform from a tightly closed rigid incubator to stretcher soft walled balloon with an opening neck. Now mother, baby and uterus can together perform the dance of labor that leads to birth. Traditionally, textbooks uh, have described uh, the uterus as the powers and the fetus as merely a passenger. The mother herself has been completely left out of the picture and her baby is objectified. If you don't understand how the uterus works in labor, we can't know how best to support women in labor. Knowing that the mother and her unborn baby play an active role in labor could transform maternity care. Freedom of movement for mother and baby would be prioritized over getting a good CTG trace, mother can't labor efficiently in a straight jacket. Margaret has four children, three born at home. She's now a grandmother, but tries not to interfere too much. Her advice for labor is to keep off the bed. Her presentation is entitled, The Wombs a Balloon, The Myth of Fundal Dominance. Please welcome Margaret for the session. Margaret, over to Hi. you. Hi, Caroline. Thank you very Hi. much. Right. Well, um, uh, right. Here we go then. Sustainable midwifery. Um, Western obstetrics is based on no, uh, on technology. It's so high tech. So midwives have got the most wonderful opportunity to delve into the physiology because the obstet obstetricians aren't really very interested anymore. Now they've got their CTGs and their scalpels and their forceps and everything. So the field is open for midwives to find out how the uterus works. Um, and it's the key to labour. Um, I think there's an intimate connection between the woman's mind and her uterus. She has to do the work, the labour. Um, and if the job of the midwife is to enable her to do that work, to relax her mind, to get rid of the stress hormones, to allow it all to happen. So I have been looking into how labor works, how birth works. And it's taken me a long time, but I'm getting there, I think. Um, so, right, that's the first page. There's lots of misconceptions in the textbooks. Um, the textbooks say that the uterus is pear-shaped. Well, there's a far better analogy, a balloon. A pear is too solid. Uh, it's got hard skin. Um, when it ripens, it falls off the tree and rots. When the uterus ripens, it opens and it lets out the baby. Physiology is, seems to be a question in the textbooks of hormones and biochemistry. But there's a whole branch of um, by biomechanics, but not just biomechanics, biological, biological mechanics, which seems to have escaped the modern obstetrician, and it hasn't got into the into the birth textbooks yet at all. Um, and I am planning a book. I think I'm ready to do it now, called The Natural Science of Childbirth. Um, I, I'm hoping this will launch me off this session, will give me the courage to actually put pen to paper, because it's about time. Um, 
the textbooks, for example, say that oxytocin causes contractions. Well, yes, it does. It does for the obstetricians. If you put an oxytocin, you usually get a contraction, but the, that doesn't really happen till second stage. But I must go on. So, Caroline, um, the next page, please. Why study the uterus? We want to find out how the biggest muscle in the body transforms from an incubator to an ejection seat. So what does it do? It stays shut. It stays shut, tightly shut for, for nine months while the baby grows and grows and it stretches and stretches. And by the end of pregnancy, most mothers would do anything to get that baby out. I remember I went overdue twice, I say overdue twice with, my, with two of mine, and you just want it to happen. But induction doesn't always work. Um, the uterus has to be ready. When it is ready, it will open in a short time. If we know how it works, we might be able to care for it, for the mother and the baby better. We need to get a respect for the uterus and we need to treat its owner with respect in order for the uterus to do its work properly. Right, next slide, please. Caroline, thank you. Right, so the obstetricians, the textbooks talk about the powers, the pass passage and the passenger. The powers is the uterus and I will agree with that. The uterus is the biggest power there is. The passage is the pelvis. But in this, in this talk, I'm not going to talk much about that because I think this talk is nearly all about the first stage of flavour. Um, the uterus has a slightly different job in the first stage of labour than it does in the in the second. And I've already said, we've already said the fetus is not just a passenger. The fetus is thought to initiate labour when the lungs are developed enough to breathe. Um, and there's a bit of biochemistry for you. It secretes SPA from alveolar lungs cells of the lung, and that seems to be what they think sets labour off. But this is the new bit. I believe, I think, that the evidence shows that the fetus directs where the uterus contracts in order to position himself ideally for the journey through the mother's pelvis. I think, just as estate agents sell houses on location, 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 I think the labour is all about the mother's position, position, position. The baby's, the fetus's position depends on the mother's position. Um, I think the fetus steers himself to the outlet, to the neck of the womb, using his neonatal reflexes. I'm not the first person to think that. And in fact, after reading my first book, Sheila Kitchener rang me up and said, hey, did you know about Milano Comparetti and his, and his fetal reflexes? It could work. Um, 1981. Um, so it's a long time ago. And Sheila, as far as I know, Sheila's the only person who's noticed that before because they're fixated on what I call the myth of fundal, fundal dominance. Next slide, please, Caroline. Right, now, so here we are. We've got the uterus being a balloon. Um, we've got a, it's a antenatal, a antenatal teacher called Liz Chalmers who's got a beautiful video up on Facebook. She, somehow, it's, I've tried this myself, it's such fun. You get a, a ping pong ball into, into a balloon, you blow up a balloon, stretch its neck um, and get a ping pong ball inside. It's, it's a little tricky, but it works. And then the ping pong ball acts as a plug. So the balloon stays tied stays blown up even without a knot in it and then she squeezes and squeezes and the baby comes out the well the ping pong ball comes out um 
Right. Well, the antenatal teacher's hands squeeze from the outside and they get the ping pong ball out. Um, the fetus kicks from the inside. And the whole thing is that if you squeeze, the material contracts, the pressures, the pressures are different. And the pressure, the change in pressure depends on where the balloon is being pressed and where, you, where the fetus is kicking. And that's how he manages to steer, I think. I can't, uh, this session is too short. I, I'll keep an eye on my watch um, to, to, to go into it much more, but that's the next book will be that. Can we have the next um, slide, please, Caroline? Thank you. Right, this is, this is a picture from my first book because I did think about this um, stretch contract reflex, I call it. Um, so this book was, I did write 30 years ago, and it's how the feeder steers. In, when I wrote the book, I didn't know, I, I believed in fundal dominance. I believed that the, the top of the uterus contracted down on the baby and pushed the baby out. I thought that's how it worked. Um, but in a trampoline, you can just see, if you look a bit closer to the screen, where the person, the trampolinist jumps, makes a difference as to where he ends up. So when he's in the middle at the top picture, he, jump, he jumps down and it gets pushed straight up in the air. On the picture on the right, if he jumps to the side, he'll get pushed back into the middle. and. On the bottom picture, I think it was my husband drew this this picture for me. Um, we put a plank underneath, so you can see that if the trampolinist jumps in the middle again, a he's going to bash his ankle on the edge of the plank, but b he'll get pushed off to the other side. And I think this might, when I did this illustration, it was to show the effect of the maternal spine if the woman was lying on her back. Um, what I'm saying is you interfere with the stretch of the trampoline, you will change the way it works. Right. Um, and I... Right, yes, the uterus is like a 3D trampoline. So in, so that's where the balloon, the, 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 the illustration I've got there is a 2D representation, a square representation, but actually a balloon is a 3D. It's like a 3D trampoline. And the fetus bounces his way towards the softest part, the exit. And that's where Milano Comparetti's Invitation of Softness comes in and the neonatal reflexes it's such fun i adore it but i can't do it justice in half an hour but i'll do my best so next one please caroline right so there are lots of similarities been between the womb and the balloon it's the same shape it expands and contracts it's elastic it's got a neck which we call the cervix in the womb um a, a balloon a blown up party balloon has a knot to keep the context contents in um it can be reused again and again if you don't knot it up you can just let it you can just let it down again and then blow it up again um as long as it doesn't actually pop and it's a user-friendly image for women much better than a pair and it's a celebration of birth and the next slide please caroline the differences Right, balloons have got one layer latex rubber, and that's what I thought until very recently, until 2015. I thought that the uterus was made of muscle, just muscle. I'm not, I'm a psychologist, not an anatomist, not a physiologist. Um, and from all my reading, from everything I'd read, muscle is what the uterus is made of. Um, 
but muscle cells are jelly-like and sloppy and sloppy and actually they can't do anything by themselves they wouldn't they don't retain their shape they're organized in bundles uh, muscle cells are and that everything is enclosed and surrounded by network after network after network of collagen a sort of rope um i've fairly recently become enamored of, of a a wonderful anatomist called gil headley who is fascinated himself by fascia which is collagen um i do recommend if you're interested in such things go to his website and find him just gill headley um right the cervix of the of the uterus is 80 percent collagen it's really strong stuff i must go to the next slide please caroline right it's like rope it's a biological rope it's stranded even it is so strong that some Paleoarchaeologists found some that was actually not even fossilized. It was it was that it had lasted sixty six million years, and it was still completely unyielding. It's absolutely amazing. And in the body, it provides a scaffolding role for all sorts of things, um, ligaments and tendons, and it keeps bundles of muscle together there's layers it's the white stuff when you're cutting up a piece of steak it's the white stuff holding everything together but it can be broken down even the 66 million year old collagen got broken down by an enzyme which unzipped it unraveled it just like you can un unraveled wool or thread is not strong anymore um, and this enzyme is called MMP. And I discovered in about um, 20, 20, 2015 that one of the differences between apes, chimpanzees and humans is that we secrete a lot more of an enzyme called MMP just before labour. And this got me thinking, I, I wanted to know what what MMP did, and this is what it does. It unravels collagen, and it made me think, well, why do we need, why do we need um, to unravel it? Could we have more collagen to start with? And I think, I think we have. I think because we walk upright, our babies need a hell of a lot more keeping in to stop them falling out. And I think that humans go into labour when the collagen network starts to break down. Let me see. Right, so the next the next slide, please. There we go. Right, so we've put we've now we've I've put a balloon. In actually, it was just a fruit net of oh, onions or something it was. Um, if you can just imagine blowing that balloon up, it's going to stop when that, when it, you can't blow it up much bigger than the net without breaking the net. Um, so that's blowing it up from the inside, from the outside. Now we've got a baby stretching it from the inside. This is the... This is the bit that's a little bit difficult to get your head around. There's something called the stretch contract reflex, which I did talk about 30 years ago, and, and which is what moves, enables the fetus to bounce his way round with. If you take that net away, the baby can kick harder and start moving and if the collagen starts melting away then the cervix can start opening because that's going to be the weakest bit um i think i've missed a bit out 
it's going to be the weakest bit because most of the neck of the uterus, most of the cervix is collagen. We already know that the cervix gets riper and the collagen melts away, as it were. Um, Jane Evans calls it cervical weeping, she calls it. Um, she was an ARM midwife, some of you might remember. Um, now, uh, next, I'm going to do a sequence of four stills from a video that I that I did. And you can, if you look down near the bottom, at the bottom of the pelvis, I've got the, the passage, the birth canal, I've got in yellow. And you can see the knot of the balloon um, through the hole, I can't remember what it's called, Linda could tell us, um, in the pubis. Uh, Symphysis, not the symphysis pubis. I can't know what it's called. Nerves. But we've got a balloon in a network of collagen. The stiff cervix is the knot of the balloon. So next one, please. Right, it's starting to melt away. And do you see that the cervix is starting to open? I don't think I we managed to melt away. I don't think we did manage to make less network at the cervix it was too complicated um but it's starting to open as soon as it can start to open it's the laws of physics pressure will fight will things will give way where there's less pressure and if you've got a hole if you've got a hole if you let go of a balloon once you've blown it up it'll blow out through the hole because that's just how physics is it's basic physics really. okay the next one please caroline is it's getting that's right it's you see we flick through that one but it but we end up with a smaller uterus because it is smaller the baby's starting to move out now um the the, the, the cervix is nearly completely open um, and the baby moves down with, as the uterus moves down, it's it's magic, really. I, um, Rachel Reed, uh, midwife thinking, was talking about that. She was talking about it with cords, wor people worrying about the cords. But you don't have to worry because the baby and the uterus are moving together, sort of. The, the uterus is clamping down and pushing the baby down. It's It's magic. It's magic. I think it's magic. It's wonderful. Um, right. Um, oh, completely out of all my slides. What have I got to? I don't even know what I'm... Right, okay. And this is where the myth of fundal dominance comes in. The dawn of the tokograph. This is a picture um, of Samuel R Reynolds trying to work out how the uterus works. It's great. I'm glad people want to know how it works. But he'd got the woman on her back and he'd got heavy equipment that that baby in there can't really move. It's got to move against gravity if it's going to stretch any bit of that uterus. And they had recordings. Do you see there's three, there's three um, topographs there that he's measuring a stretch in three different places and he's getting wiggly lines and his wiggly lines told him that the pressure was greatest at the top and that there was a pressure gradient and that contractions always moved from the top to the bottom. This illustration comes from a book, his, the second edition of Physiology of the Uterus, published in 1949. I got the first edition the other day, published in 1939, and it's not mentioned at all. It's just not mentioned. This It seems to be that the myth of fundal dominance came with this scientific discovery of three wiggly lines that seemed to show that that's what was happening. Um, so, yes, 
uh, right, okay. And this is a this is a picture again. My husband drew this picture. I think I put the arrows on, but um, we've got slightly heavier arrows at the top. I don't think. Oh, it does. Can you see my arrow? Can you see my pointer? Don't know whether you can. Um, Fundal dominance in a in a picture. This is this is what Reynolds thought was happening, and I think it's wrong. Let's go to the next one, Caroline, please. Right, and this is again. It's an old. It's an old obstetric textbook before. The myth of fundal dominance and can you see all those arrows there's arrows from the outside and there's arrows from the baby he's even got the baby kicking he's got arrows from the baby's head he's got arrows from all over the place and i think it, 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 we know it's the first stage of labor because the cervix is still the cervix is still closed or it might just starting to open perhaps um the placenta's in about the right place. The placentas are usually to the side, not at the top. So many textbooks put them at the top and they're not. Right, so let's this this is the first stage of labor. Let's go to the next one, Caroline. Please. Right, I've called this magic migrating muscle because this seems to be what, what it's another bit of the myth that it only seems to come from midwives. Um, but I've heard quite a few of them talk of it, and I don't believe it, actually. Um, we have got to the second stage, and yes, the muscle at the top is thicker than the muscle at the bottom. The cervix has opened. The muscle at the lower segment and the cervix is as thin as anything. And we do have fundal dominance now because that baby is pushing its way out. It's it can't actually rotate very much more. It's quite well into the pelvis. Um, let's go to the next slide, please. How are we doing for time? Not too bad. Um, and I'm just wondering whether this picture of Common Sparkly, 1932, I think it was, is the source of the fundal, fundal dominance thing um, myth. But we're in second stage on the in the on the picture on the right hand side. Um, but I think what's actually happening is the beginnings of evolu of involution. So we've got a lot of co collagen all over the uterus. He's it's even the got smaller. I think um, if you think back to that last orange balloon. Um, won't we won't go back to it now you can you can wait till it's back on youtube um and look at it there or you can look at my um animation that we did which is on my website which is birthupright.co.uk right next one please caroline right okay so we now we've got we're back to that that balloon and we've got what happens when you try to force labour with oxytocin? If you force labour with oxytocin, you're going to make the whole uterus contract all at once because it's an unphysiological amount of oxytocin and, and it will affect all the muscle. Instead of the baby deciding where he's going to stretch, the infused oxytocin will make the whole uterus contract as one and there will be fundal dominance and the baby won't be able to rotate or move and find his own way out he's forced out the oxytocin will act most where the muscle is thickest which is at the fundus um and if the mother is unable to move and tethered to the ctg machine that's not going to help either and if she's got a an epidural she might need one of course sometimes women do but I think we've got pain and malfunction here okay next one please Caroline 
this is the picture, this is the diagram that made me rethink the frontal dominance thing because this picture came from, it was an active labor picture. Um, can you see that red stripe in the middle? The, the, the diagram underneath, the colored one, is a snapshot of what's happening at where it says 40. And those arrows are the direction of contractions. So that dark red bottom left is the strongest bit of contraction. Um, and it's built by combining 16 transducers around the maternal umbilicus, which is, and they're not going, tell me, they're not going downwards, they're going up. And they're starting at the bottom left-hand corner, and I should think that's where the baby's kicking, or well, that might be where his head is, I don't know, we don't know, but it's, that's the uterus and the baby interacting with each other. I'm completely off my script. Oh, um, but it's there on the, do you know what? If you're in a lecture hall, you get some feedback. It's difficult doing this with no feedback. That's just me being a psychologist. Right, next one, please, Caroline. And now we do it. We're okay. Um, right, so during the majority of pregnancy, the primary function of the uterus is to not contract. This, despite signals that other smooth muscles would normally interpret as signals for activity. I'm not the only person to be thinking about how the uterus works. This is from Roger Young. It's well worth looking up that paper because he's, he's, um, he's not a frontal dominance man either. He's, you know, at least there are some people still, some obstetricians still wanting to know how it all works and not just wanting to put in oxytocin or cut the baby out. Right, next one, please, um, Caroline. Okay, <laughs> right, we are getting fairly near the end now. Um, how birth works. Yes, the uterus is the power. The uterus is the engine of labor. During pregnancy, we've you, you turn the key in the lock, in the, oh, the starter motor goes, and it's ticking over, and you're sitting there waiting to move off. No gear collect, um, connected. Um, but the engine's going, but the car's not going anywhere. We haven't. We've got the handbrake on. You don't need the foot brake on um, until you've tried to move off because we've got the clutch there, which is the engine's not engaged. You have to engage the engine before the car will go anywhere. I should have done an automatic transmission model, but I don't understand that very well. I must get one of my sons to tell me about that. Towards the end of pregnancy, you're starting to get ready for labor. The clutch, the woman's going to put her foot on the clutch. She's going to put it right down to the floor. She's going to bring it up to engage the engine. And the engine is the powerhouse of getting that baby out. Um, okay, next one, please, Caroline. Right. Now, what I think happens in birth, in the stress of birth, the stress hormones disengage the engine and they put the foot brake on. And they interfere with oxytocin. Um, so they cut off an oxytocin supply to the uterus. Um, Have I gone too far? In order to move off, you've got to engage the engine, you've got to take your foot off the foot brake, and you have got to put your foot on the accelerator, allow petrol to get to the engine. 
and it's quite a subtle set of movements which the uterus and the baby and the mother's brain all decide how to do all by themselves without us doing anything. Um, if we're on a hill and we take, we, we let go of the handbrake, um, the car will just roll down anyway. Actually, babies get born. If the mother is paralyzed, babies get born, can get born without. What I'm saying is that the uterus lets go of the baby. The uterus lets the baby out. It's magic. Um, unless you have interference from stress hormones. So let's have the next slide, Caroline. Um, second stage. Second stage. Right. Second stage is where Ferguson's reflex clicks in. And the foot goes on the floor and there's lots of oxytocin and the baby comes out. Um, oh, gosh, what? Right, I must zip on, zip on. Um, you'll just have to look on YouTube, I think. Next slide, please, Caroline. Right, so... If the mother isn't in control, if the mother's stressed, everything goes wrong. Um, and we end up having to have the baby born by cesarean section or by forceps or by... And we end up with fetal trauma, with HIE, which has been linked with oxytocin during during labor um artificial oxytocin pitocin syntocin on and the mother ends up with ptsd and this is why i like home birth and i think that's probably the end of the end of the talk there we are right so actually i know my daughter made this gave gave me this things for christmas she said, raise hell and change the world. But actually, for birth, we want to keep calm and carry on. <laughs> so, 